another visitor. Stay a while. Stay forever. Ein Podcast über alte Spiele von zwei alten Männern. Stay Forever mit Gunnar Lott und Christian Schmidt. Hello, I'm here with David Fox. David Fox is one of the founding members of Lucasfilm Games in 1982. He stayed with the company for 10 years, working in various roles on iconic games such as Rescue on Fractalus, Manic Mansion, Zack McCracken, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and others. Before he joined the company, he was an author of computer books, a consultant and the co-founder of an early computer school. After a stint at Lucasfilm Games and LucasArts, he worked as a consultant and for a number of companies in creative and executive roles, creating interactive experiences. He returned to Point and Click Adventures in 2017 when he joined Ron Gilbert for Thimbleby Park. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. And welcome, Christian. Yes, I'm here as well. <laughs> 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 He doesn't need an introduction, I believe, so everybody knows him in our small podcast world. So let us start off with you, David, taking us back to 1982. How did you get involved with the group that would later become LucasArts? Well, as you mentioned, we had a computer center. It wasn't quite a school, though we did teach programming, mostly like you know, for kids and for adults, but they were just like short classes. They weren't professional training It was a nonprofit. It was a public access microcomputer center. We had we started with 10 computers. I think we were the first microcomputer center that I am aware of. I don't know if there were others, but we launched it in 1977, the same year that Star Wars came out. And we happened to be located in the same county that George Lucas lived in, which is Marin County, just north of San Francisco. And so there were, you know, like these like little interweavings between us and them. I think they rented some video equipment from us once for a school event where his kids went to school and, you know, just a few things. I always had this dream of working there because I loved the film so much when it first came out. I always imagined you know, I would love to be a part of that company and find any way I could to get as close to being in the movie or in that universe as I could. I was on my second book, which was Computer Animation Primer, was going to be a split book between looking at state-of-the-art computer animation and also doing computer animation on your home Atari 800 computer. And during the research part of that, I reached out to the Lucasfilm Computer Division, which was nearby. They were very magnanimous. They offered to have me come down. I talked to a bunch of other people. I hung out with them at the next SIGGRAPH, the computer graphics show, and also got to meet Lauren Carpenter, who was the person who created the flyby animation in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, the Genesis planet terraforming sequence. And we hung out for a while. We were just kind of speculating on, you know, the future technology, like would there ever be computers for home that could have 24-bit color and what that would cost. And just, you know, a lot of speculation. It was kind of fun hanging with them, especially at SIGGRAPH. A lot of that information went into the book. And a year later, so this would be in 1982, I was done with my manuscript. And one of our members at the computer center who happened to work at Industrial Light and Magic, mentioned that he heard a new games group was being started at Lucasfilm inside the computer division. And since I had already had contacts there, I had already talked to the head of the computer division when I came to meet with them. It was an easy phone call to ask to interview for the job. And apparently this was early enough. They had just a few days before hired Peter Langston, who was going to be the manager of the group and hadn't even come on board yet. And Catmull promised me that I would get to talk with him once he was there. So I got an early interview. I showed him the manuscript for the book. Another coincidence, Atari gave Lucasfilm, or I don't know if they gave them, but they provided a million dollars as seed money to start the new computer games group using Atari computers. So the fact that my book was on the Atari, the fact that I was local, that I already knew some people there, that I was super enthusiastic about working for the company at all. Just the timing just was perfect. 
I ended up getting hired three months later and was the third person in what became Lucasfilm Games. So Peter first, and then another guy, Rob Poor, came over from the computer division because he preferred trying his hand on games instead of what he was working on, which was, I think, laser printing of film. And that was it. So September 1st, 1982 was my first day. And also, I should say that because we were pretty early, our space that they were going to put us in at the complex wasn't quite ready yet. So for the first three months, I was sharing an office with Lauren Carpenter, the person I had met a year earlier. That led to the creation of Rescue on Fractalus because I asked him early on whether he thought it might be possible to create a game on a 8-bit computer using fractals, a you know, fly-through game. And he thought about it and eventually came up with a solution of how to do it. So that's how I got to the company. You mentioned that your book on animation was focused on the Atari 800. I think that, if I'm not mistaken, in your computer center, you basically had access to almost all of, if not all of the home computers of that era. And I assume you were familiar with most, if not all of them. What drew you towards the Atari in particular? That's a good question. Yeah, we had, I think, maybe four or five Apple IIs. We ended up having a lot more Ataris. Because we were a nonprofit, we got a few grants to help to do outreach to schools. And Atari also gave us a bunch of computers. I think they donated a bunch of Atari 400s and 800s. And after a few years, we ended up with about 40 computers in all. And by then, the majority of them were Atari. I just like that computer. I met Chris Crawford, who wrote Del Rey Atari, I think it's called. He came and gave a talk at our computer center to a computer club. And he had written this great book that kind of gave you the inner workings of the system. And I could see how much more powerful it was than the Apple II for graphics at that point. I thought there was a lot more you could do with it than you could on the Apple II. That's what I wanted to focus on. I think also its trajectory, you could see the Apple II seemed to be fading and the Atari was rising at that point. By the time the book came out, it already reached its peak and was on its way down. I think the Commodore 64 was the next computer that was coming up. But if I waited a year, I probably would have done a Commodore 64 book, but that wasn't the case. Was the Marin Computer Center a way to earn a livelihood, or was this like a hobby project? Well, it was definitely our livelihood project. When we decided to do it, my wife is and was an educator. She had been teaching at a preschool or actually running a preschool and had just left that place, and we were looking at the next thing to do. Actually, it wasn't, oh, let's just start a computer center. It was really, I was looking at a long-term goal of working in location-based entertainment, and I was imagining interactive Disneylands and places where you could go where all the attractions were totally immersive and totally interactive, and thought that would be something that would be coming soon, like maybe 10 years away. It was totally off in my prediction, but I knew that I didn't have the training to be able to be there when that happens. Okay, let's do something in computers. I didn't want to do an arcade because that just didn't match our interests and our areas of expertise. And so the computer center became the focus. We never sold computers. It was really an educational place. And since it was nonprofit, after we left, all the assets stay with the center. So it was really more a passion of mine to learn about this, to learn about games, learn about programming. In retrospect, it looked like a perfect stepping stone for the Lucasfilm Games job, not only being in the right place at the right time, but having the right book on the right topic and having already met the right people. So it's like everything was just perfectly lined up for me to get that job. You said you interviewed for a job at Lucasfilm Games or at the New Games Group. What was that job you interviewed for? I think it was game designer, programmer. I didn't care. <laughs> 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 Whatever it was, I wanted it. In fact, when I finally got the phone call that I had been hired, I mean, I kept on pinging Peter to find out what was going on because it's taking a really long time and I got a really good sense that I was going to get it. But it was just, you know, they were slow in getting everything geared up. So I don't know how many other people he was considering, Dave Levine got hired like a month after me, so he was early on also. Peter was specifically looking for people who were not a part of the large companies doing game development. He wanted a group of people who could reinvent 
the process of creating games, kind of bring it more into the computer science arena as opposed to coming from the other direction. It was a great idea. I think we were able to use some of the computer divisions, high-end tools like Evans and Sutherland computer, vector graphics computer, to visualize like Rescue on Fractalist and how it looked like, you know, much easier to bring that up than it was to get running on the Atari. But yeah, I think that's it. Did you write code? Yeah, I did write code. In fact, when I joined, clearly we weren't going to write our games in BASIC, the language BASIC. So I had to learn 6502, and I learned it on the job. We had a guy who came on board to create a high-end cross-assembler. So we actually were working in a Unix environment on a VAX 750 computer via a terminal. We would write our code in that, and then it was connected via an extra serial port to the Atari 800. So we would write the code, it would compile, and then download it to the Atari. And then we'd check to see whether it worked. That turnaround was probably a lot faster than would have been if we had done it on the Atari itself. In fact, I could use an advanced text editor, Emacs, to do a lot of my work there. And the fact that we had this pretty powerful cross-assembler, I think that helped. But I guess it didn't take me that long. I mean, the truth is, the type of code I was doing was a lot more of the glue in the game. So the gameplay elements, the intro sequences, the cockpit, and all that really, what I would consider heavy-duty lifting was really done by Lauren Carpenter for the Fractal Engine and Charlie Kellner, who did all the flight dynamics and the character animation, the cell animation, the sound routines, and a lot of the more complex computer science-y stuff. So I just got to do the fun stuff and try to glue it all together so it felt right as a game. I think it was about six months into the project when I was asking Peter something about the game. And he says, well, you should decide that you're the project leader. It was like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like I had never considered that. This is one of the first two projects we were doing, and the terminology project leader hadn't been applied to it. And I just didn't even consider that I was in charge of this game. It was just seemed like a team effort and said, okay, all right, okay, I'm the project leader and the designer. So I guess I have control. <laughs> so this was more like a designer producer role in modern terms. Producer was not a fixed role then, I think. Yeah, we had no producers. So for most of the time I was there, project leaders were generally the designer, producer, and one of the programmers on the games. Then as we got bigger, you know, we eventually brought in producers and we brought in some games where the designer was not one of the programmers. And really eight years I was at Lucasfilm Games, that's the way it was. I mean, the last two years I was at the company, I was doing location-based entertainment projects. So during the eight years I was doing games for the home, that was kind of the way we set it up. You contributed to many of the early Lucasfilm games in one capacity or another. Could you, you know, not walk us through everything, but give us a few examples or highlights of the games and what you did on that specific game? Sure. Well, there weren't that many, so I could go through all of them. So Rescue and Fractalist, um, project leader, designer, and one of the coders. And playtester. Why don't we even have outside playtesters at that point? So we had to do a lot of playtesting. Then Labyrinth, I was the designer and project leader on that one. And Charlie Kellner was the technical lead on that. That was really our first graphic adventure game that we did based on the Jim Henson movie. Then on Maniac Mansion, Ron Gilbert asked me to come on board for a couple of months to try out this new scripting language he had created. He thought that we could get the whole game completed in a couple of months and I was on for at least six months, as it turned out, and I was the first official scum scripter. Obviously, it contributed some design, but the game was pretty much designed ahead of time, but not finely designed. So they would know the names of the rooms and the characters and essentially the plot points, things that were supposed to happen, but all the scripting and dialogue and interactions were things that we kind of did as we went. They weren't planned out ahead of time in very much detail. Then I took that same system, what I learned from Maniac Mansion, and I did Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders, and then Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. On that one, I was 
co-leading it with Ron Gilbert and Noah Faustine, which is unusual. They have three designer project leaders on a single project. We're really tight schedules, so we thought that would be the way to get it out before the movie released, or by the time the movie released. And also a scripter on that one. So designer, project leader, scripter. And that was pretty much the last... I have a credit as a producer on a game called Pipe Dream. But around that time... I became the director of operations for a year and stopped working on games within Lucasfilm, which by that point had become LucasArts. My job then was more to hire more programmers, more scum scripters. We called them scumlets. Tim Schaefer, Dave Grossman were in that group. And adding a second level of management that we didn't have before because we had grown from a group of 15 when we got to Skywalker Ranch to By this point, we were around 65 or 70. Everyone had been reporting to Steve Arnold, our manager at the time. So I became the intermediate manager and I kind of set up infrastructure by hiring different heads of different departments and just kind of made it easier to handle organization. You mentioned Labyrinth. There's one thing that I've always wondered, and now I have you to ask, David, from In particular, a German point of view, Lucasfilm Games in the 80s and also in the 90s is considered an adventure games company, first and foremost. However, it didn't start like that. Your first games were primarily action games. So how did that switch towards adventure games come about? And why did it then consolidate around adventure games? Good question. Well, Labyrinth was kind of an opportunity. It wasn't us saying, hey, we should make a game based on that. Because Lucasfilm was the producer or publisher, distributor of the film, they came to us and asked us whether we might be interested in doing game based on it. And we looked at some video and thought, this feels much more like an adventure. Let's try doing an adventure game. And obviously, we didn't invent the genre. There was the text adventures before that. In fact, one of the things I did at the Marine Computer Center was worked with Scott Adams of Adventure International and had offered to convert or port his text adventures, which were designed for the TRS-80, the Radio Shack computer, over to the Apple II. That was my first introduction, really, to doing a port of a game and looking at code and looking at text adventures. So I personally loved adventure games, the logic and the feeling of being immersed in something, and that was very close to my future dream of uh, location-based entertainment, like a long-form immersion kind of an experience. So the adventure games are probably the closest that you could get back at that point, where you could actually be in a world that someone created for hours and hours, have it be constantly changing and a story being told. So that seemed like a great fit. From there, Ron really wanted to do Maniac Mansion. And I think he was also looking at a format And I think when he realized that adventure game would be the perfect way, obviously we were looking at Sierra Online's popularity and the kind of games they were doing and tried to figure out what we could do that would be different and more approachable than what they were doing and it just evolved. And I guess a lot of the focus was there. I mean, that clearly that wasn't the only stuff we were doing. We had some other games that were running at the same time that were simulations, either flight or boat or whatever simulators. And those were also super popular, just that there wasn't a lot of cross-fertilization between those two, other than, I guess, maybe Noah Faustin, who worked on both ends. So he was kind of doing both simulator stuff and also adventure games. So I don't know. I mean, it makes sense in retrospect. We're a film company. We tell stories. This is as close as we could get to being in a movie, was creating an adventure game. That was the way I like to think about it. Let's move on to Zach McCracken. How was the team for Zach McCracken set up? How many people in which roles? Well, it was a pretty small team. I was at the start. I actually had an idea for the kind of game I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to to include a lot of new agey woo-woo stuff, psychic stuff and alien stuff and everything. And Steve Arnold, who had a friend who lived up in the Seattle area named David Spangler, who was pretty much an expert in a lot of this stuff. He's a spiritualist and he wrote a bunch of books. He's a pretty fun guy, actually. So Steve flew me up there, spent a couple of days with David brainstorming about everything that we could kind of shoehorn into a game. He mentioned a bunch of the locations that we ended up using and some of the ideas. And I 
brought all that back down and took several months to turn it into a design document that went through the entire game. I knew that I was going to use Scum again. I knew that it had to be expanded in some ways to do things I wanted to do and worked with Ron on that. And he did the upgrades and the changes to the system to, to give me more capability that I needed. The biggest change probably was taking a lot of the user interface, which was hard-coded in Maniac Mansion, and creating it with the scripts themselves so we could be much more customizable. So I was able to switch up on the verbs rather than being stuck with the same verbs that you had before. I could do different ones. I could turn them on or off. I could swap out completely new verbs if I wanted to, which we did. Like when you're mind linking with various creatures, we give you a different set of verbs that would be much more limited, but would be appropriate for that creature. And also pseudo rooms. We were developing this for the Commodore 64 and disk space was still a premium. So I wanted to do a bunch of mazes in this game. Probably went overboard based on feedback, but the idea that we could use one set of artwork and have rooms that would kind of be like a room, but draw on the same art and just turn on and off objects and connect them differently. And they'd be treated like a room, but they just borrow the same art. So the storage on disk would not be increased, but you get a lot more space. And I just wanted this to be feel expansive, like after spending all those months stuck in a mansion, I wanted to break out. So I ended up making it global and also off to Mars. So got a lot more places. And I've heard from people that they had this feeling like they really were exploring the world. I think someone said they became a geographer or something based on their experience in the game. They just liked being able to explore and be out and see different parts of the world they had never seen before, even though it was our version of that. So then I realized pretty soon that I just wasn't going to be able to script this myself. So I invited Matthew Allen Kane to pop over and join me. He was already working for Lucasfilm Learning, which was kind of a sister group that was doing more educational stuff. We knew each other. I liked him. And he was kind of looking for something else to do. He was great. I mean, we had a similar sense of humor. We basically broke up the game into sections where he would take certain rooms and I would take certain rooms. He also did all the music. He was a musician. And that was the team for that part. And as far as the art end, we had a couple of artists, I think. Gary Winnick, Martin, Bucky Cameron. It's a little confusing because there were so many versions that we ended up doing pretty close to each other, you know, from Commodore 64, then doing the PC version and other ones where we brought in artists to have to redo the art. I think Mark Ferrari worked on some of it later on. But by the time we got to those versions, I was pretty much off that project onto something else. So I wasn't directly involved with most of that. And I think that was it. I mentioned Ron, it might have been Chris Grigg, who did some of the sound effects for us. I believe that's the team. We actually did have a test department by then made of like a couple of testers. So there were play testers involved for a change. And I still remember the look on our lead tester, Judith, who would pop into my room with this kind of sadistic grin on her face because she had found a really crazy bug. And I knew what that meant, that look. So I think I still get dreams about that. <laughs> I'm trying to understand how project initiation worked at Lucasfilm Games in that era. So you were working on Manic Mansion, that product shipped, and then what? Did your manager, Steve Arnold, come to you and say, we need a new adventure game now, we've invested so much time and money into that engine, create something? Or did you get to choose? Or how was that initialized? Mostly the designer would come up and choose. On Maniac Mansion, I actually left the project before it shipped. After six months, I was there a lot longer than I thought I would be, and I really wanted to get on to my next game, which would be this. Basically, a designer would write up a concept document. It might be like two or three pages, distribute it to the other designers and to the management, the management being Steve Arnold, and get feedback. And then you kind of get a up or down vote or feedback, and then you get launched. And I don't remember anything about budgeting. Our teams were so small, it wasn't like, we're going to put millions of dollars into this. Their games budgets were, I don't know, $150,000 in that range at the time. We would just kind of get the green light and just start doing it. And sometimes we have freedom to play with ideas or designs for months before we came up with something that we might want to do next. 
at least at that point, it was pretty open. I mean, we had started more like an R&D group, a research group. In fact, the first two games we did, which were you know, Rescue and Fractalist and Ballblazer, were intended initially as throwaway games, kind of experimental games where you just see whether we could come up with something interesting and if we could go into production. But there was no pressure to get this out by a certain time. Very different than any other company I know of because our major source of funding wasn't coming from the games we were going to produce initially. That shifted at some point, obviously. But in the beginning, we were like a small experimental group within this larger company that was making a lot of money from its films. So that pressure to either succeed or lose your job or lose the company never really felt like an issue during the time I was there. We had that kind of freedom. On the other hand, there was the pressure that I think we all felt, especially early on, that we had to produce games that were going to be as popular and innovative as the Star Wars movies were at the time. That was a huge amount of pressure for us to live up to and the expectations that maybe the fans would have. And that's pretty much why the first two games were considered possible throwaway games, because that would take some of the pressure away that we didn't have to have a hit the very first go that we were doing. So I'm sure it changed as the budgets got bigger. I'm sure there was a lot more development. In the 90s, the game designs ended up being these thick binders with storyboards and all the scripts written out and way more information because the budgets were going way up because the art was getting much more detailed and expansive. But when I was there, that really wasn't an issue because the art was all either Commodore 64 or, or PC. And even Last Crusade was originally an EGA graphics format game. So there either wasn't a huge amount of art resources put into it compared to you know the later games with lots of animation and everything. Were you even taken seriously? Because even if you had a hit, everything you did compared to the film business was so small, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, within the company, we'd have these annual company meetings and I think George referred to us as the Lost Patrol or something. He knew that at some point, games would get bigger and bigger, and the level of quality of the graphics and imagery would match film production. So he figured, okay, let's nurse it while we could. I don't want them really to lose money, but they don't have to have huge hits at the time. I think within the computer division, we were kind of taken like here we are doing games with six colors and they're doing high-end computer graphics with 24-bit <laughs> colors and alpha channels and all the anti-aliasing. In fact, the anti-aliasing was a new technology they just come up with in order to get the stair-stepping out of lines on a raster display. And one of the in-jokes we had for Rescue on Fractalus was calling it Behind Jaggy Lines because, in fact, the name of the monster was the Jaggy, which was directly from the dreaded jaggies in computer graphics. So I just turned them into a monster. If you remember, the screen for that had a couple of super jagged struts going for the windshield. So you're actually playing the game both behind the jaggy enemy lines and also behind the jaggy lines of the screen. And they thought that was too esoteric. They didn't think that would be a good name, so that got canned. I really like that was my favorite name, though. <laughs> so I don't think they took us seriously for a long time. They weren't nasty to us, but you know, we weren't doing serious computer graphics. We weren't doing real computer graphics. We were just the toy group, kind of, like doing these little fun toys. Also, I just want to mention this, too, is that during the time I was there, we weren't allowed to do anything in the Star Wars universe. And my first game, I had visualized it as a Star Wars first-person flight game. And when I found out, like, pretty much within a day after I got there, that all the licenses to Star Wars had already been sold and committed to other companies for the foreseeable future, it was a pretty big blow, because here I am at the Star Wars company, and I can't do anything in the Star Wars universe. It took another eight years before I was able to do anything within Star Wars, and that was the location-based entertainment project we did. In retrospect, that was really, really good that we weren't able to because it let us push our own creativity, come up with original stories, and not be tied into George's baby. I believe he would have been way more hands-on with us if we had been doing Star Wars stuff. It probably wouldn't have had the freedom to do what we were doing without him there looking over our shoulders all the time. So that gave us a lot of room to grow and find our own voice. When you 
sat down to write that concept for Sekma Kraken or for the game that would become Sekma Kraken, was it clear to you from the beginning that you would be using the Scum engine? Yes, that was clear before I even went to start brainstorming or started doing the concept document. And I saw the potential of using that system and I had learned it pretty well after working on the game for that period. You know, given the few things I wanted to do differently, expansion stuff, Ron was open to that. And each game that used it ended up getting expanded features and adapted to different systems. And how long was that in production? You know, for at least another 10 years, maybe? I don't know. It just kept on being used a lot. And in fact, recently when I worked with Ron on Thimbleweed Park, obviously we didn't use Scum, but the language and the environment was very familiar to me and very similar to the way you would think about coding a Scum game. You know, you definitely could see the roots and took the good things from that and added a bunch of more stuff. How were decisions made about the game in your little group there? Was this like a team effort? Yeah. Okay. So there's the brainstorming with David Spangler, my design doc. I took the larger design document and distributed it among the designers. And Ron Gilbert in particular felt that it wasn't funny enough. I mean, it was funny from the beginning, but it wasn't as twisted as Maniac Mansion was. And we ended up doing a brainstorming meeting with all the designers and some of the leads in the group. And that came up with the idea that we changed the guy's name. Originally, it was Jason. I think it was called Ancient Aliens or Jason and the Ancient Aliens. That shifted to Zach. We actually used a Marin County phone book and we're looking for names and found Zach at one place and McCracken somewhere else. We choose that for his name and came up with the title and changed his job from a mainstream media reporter to a tabloid reporter, which meant we could get much more wackier with everything. So to kind of take everything and just shifted it like 90 degrees into much weirder territory. And that was the tone we pretty much kept throughout the game. So that was pretty fun. And then for the game itself, it was probably mostly between just me and Matthew. I mean, obviously during playtests, you get feedback of things that people didn't understand or things that people were having trouble with, they were getting stuck, and we can go back and make those adjustments. But as far as gameplay, we come up with all the puzzles. We would describe the room to the artists, what we needed there. They come back with the room and we'd see stuff in the room, which maybe we hadn't thought of. And we would try to incorporate that and make that more interactive. So it's definitely group effort in that way. I mean, we never had anyone come in and say, you got to change this in the game. It was pretty much my game. And if Matthew had a suggestion, I'd listen to it and either would accept it or not, depending on whether I felt it matched. It felt pretty open in that anyone could make a suggestion and we would hear it and you know, see whether it was right. Often when you do a game, you know something's not quite right someplace and you're hoping no one will notice. And once you start getting feedback, you hear one or two people say the same thing that you've been thinking about in the back of your mind, hoping no one would notice, then you obviously you have to go in there and make the change and fix it so that it works better. One of the best parts about working there was the feeling of collaborative environment. You know, people would be free to give ideas and people were free to listen to them or not listen to them. And we all would hear other people's feedback and then go off, incorporate what we thought we needed to, thinking more as polish and say, yep, you know, this is a problem. So that was great. I really missed that. I kind of assumed that was the way all companies ran. And Other jobs I had after that, it's a rude awakening when I realized, no, that was really unique in that environment. And working on Thimbleweed Park decades later was so fun because it kind of recaptured that whole collaborative environment. You mentioned that somebody came to your office. Were you organized in offices or were you sitting by department or did you have an open space? So over the time I was there, we were in four different locations Probably the longest period was at the Skywalker Ranch. When George built Skywalker Ranch, he built it with a storyboard or a story in mind. It was supposed to look like it had been there for 150 years or something. And there was this old sea captain who built this mansion, and then he added on a winery. And, you know, So each building had a backstory, and the architecture and the way it looked 
would match that. In fact, the main house looked like it had a couple of different architectural styles as if there had been additions added on over the decades back in the 1800s. When, of course, the whole thing had just been built. So we were off in the stable house, which was supposed to be where the horses were. The walls were kind of a rough wood, painted white. It felt much more rustic than most of the rest of the place. And we thought that was appropriate to put the game designers in the stables. But it was a center courtyard, a two-story building, and the offices were around the perimeter. There were two central rooms that were kind of common spaces. Each had a fireplace that was pretty much always in use during the winter, which is really cozy. Each one had a small kitchen, and then we had offices. I guess being there early, I got to choose which office I wanted. It was a pretty small one-person office, but I did have a couch in there, and I had a view out the window to a stream that would be running with water during the winter. I could see wildlife. I remember seeing a bobcat out my window once. and So it was really out in the countryside, very rustic. And rather than pick up the phone and call another person, we'd generally walk over to their office and ask if they could talk. We would spend a lot of time at lunch going over stuff and asking questions about if you got stuck, giving feedback to each other's games over lunch. And I think we had one room, which we called the art pit, more like an open space, larger room with like maybe five or six desks in it. I think mostly designers, project leaders were more likely to get their own room or maybe share with one other person. Well, it was a great place, I and mean, I loved working there. And then we outgrew it after four years, and we had to move back to more an industrial area where we had a much larger space. When you look at game design these days, or at games production, it's very formalized, but you describe it as very informal. Did you have like production stand-ups or Kanban board type of things, or was it mainly improv? It was kind of a mix. I think as the games got bigger, we did more of the other. I mean, Maniac Mansion, definitely. We had a whiteboard and a lot of the stuff was on that. We were using, I think it was called Microplanner. It was Mac-based production planning software, but we weren't using it for production planning. We were using it for the flow charts. So we could see the dependency charts of how puzzles related to other puzzles. Like in order to do this puzzle, you have to do this, this, and this, and you can map that out in that program and then get a big printout on paper paste them all together and kind of get an overview of how the game worked. So we would use those. And eventually, you, know, you just keep the game in your head as you move on. So you just remember everything. At least for those games that I worked on during the 80s, we did not have milestones or deadlines or deliverables or any of that. It felt much more open. I know that changed later on, especially as you got producers in, you know, to kind of make sure you were on target for the ship dates and all that. But for the early games, you just kind of figure, okay, this is going to take about this much time, and you were usually given the freedom to do that. As Zach McCracken is the game after Manic Mansion and uses the same technology and is in many ways obviously a similar game, how did Manic Mansion influence the design of Zach McCracken? Did you have lessons you learned or things you saw in Manic Mansion you wanted to avoid? Yeah, well, the biggest thing was... I didn't want to have selectable characters. I wanted to be able to switch characters, but I didn't want to let the player decide which characters are going to be in the game. So in Maniac Mansion, you choose who two of the kids are that are going to be playing the game with the main kid, Dave, at the very beginning, which meant that you had all these additional combinations of possibilities, like if you chose this one and that one. And that's probably what made the game take a lot longer to create or produce was having to make sure that the game was winnable no matter what your combination of characters were. Well, in Zach, that was easy. It was much more straight line. So rather than having the game be replayable multiple times, I wanted to put all that into a more maybe serial game or sequential game. So it felt larger, it felt like a larger world because you pretty much played every room and every scene in the game to get through it. There weren't a lot of alternative options that we had. So I kind of wanted to have everything be visible on the screen so people really felt the vastness of the game. So it's the main thing is really just to make sure that I chose what the characters were going to be in the game and the player didn't get to. You already mentioned that at the core of the game's narrative 
are ideas borrowed from New Age. So ideas that come from esoteric themes or fringe theories, like you already mentioned, ancient astronauts. And of course, we wonder, why is that? I grew up as a kid devouring science fiction, H.G. Wells and Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov. I like the genre of science fiction. I like the whole idea of weird things happening in the past, the psychic phenomena stuff. I always thought that was so cool. We had a game where I get to learn how to use a couple of different abilities during the process that we don't have. I had a friend when I was young whose parents let him buy as many comic books as he wanted to. So whenever I'd sleep over at his house going through comic books and I'd have superpowers and abilities and that just seemed really cool. So it was just, you know, taking everything that I was passionate about and trying to squeeze it into a single game and so make it feel cohesive. I think the whole tabloid construct was a perfect way to do that because nothing was too crazy or wild to add in there. The crazier it is, the better it felt like it was a tabloid story. So I could just take all those tabloid stories we've heard or the ones we might think had never been printed and just put all the conspiracy theories we could think of, the fun ones, you know, not the terrible ones, <laughs> and just throw them all in there. So like you know, the whole thing with Elvis and the stuff with Aliens in Disguise, and I think the whole bit with the flight attendant on the airplane came out of a couple of bad experiences with nasty flight attendants on flights. So I felt like I was getting my revenge. <laughs> I'm probably not the only person who had it because a lot of people seem to like that part of the game. This is obviously before terrorist attacks, so you could feel free to blow something up in a microwave oven without getting killed on the airplane for the police with a security guard. But, you know, that was just fun. So I got to kind of create the universe that I would have liked to have read in terms of a book or a movie. Back then, did you have an affinity towards New Age ideas? Yeah. In fact, I probably was doing stuff like that. I mean, there were times like when I was in college and soon after where I was doing personal growth stuff that was in that arena. And there was, I mean, I was actually doing counseling with people where I was a counselor and woo woo stuff in that sometimes. The last thing I want to do was to proselytize or make it seem like I'm forcing ideas. So, in fact, the whole thing was tongue in cheek and kind of a parody and exaggerated meant that I could go there without worrying that I was going to offend people. Although there are people who got offended. There's that letter that we got from a guy who was a minister, I guess, who was just accusing us of creating a game that was full of witchcraft and devil worship and all these terrible things. And he was going to tell his people not to do it. But from my point of view, it was all just fun. It had a guru who could float. It was all part of the fun to me. <laughs> One aspect of New Age, as I understand it, is spirituality. Are you a spiritual person? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I'm not religious. I mean, I believe in karma. I feel like that's a real thing. I think we've been here before. I think the whole thing of past lives and reincarnations, probably there's a truth to that. But it's not like something which I think about very much. It's kind of just part of my reality of the view of the world. I think that we're here to learn lessons, that there probably is some greater force somewhere. I don't picture some God looking down at us controlling our lives that doesn't match with my reality at all. I don't go to any religious practices. I never really did. So I think that would still match closer, but not in a serious, focused way. Just kind of, that's just the way that I view the world, I guess. Does that make sense? It does. I've seen other people's recollections about the early days of Lucasfilm games. And in these recollections, one or two of them, I've seen you described as an idealist. What made you an idealist back then? Hmm. I don't know. It might be <laughs> tied to this background and seeing people as inherently good. I started off in college, was going for an engineering major and quickly realized that wasn't for me and switched to humanistic psychology. So I was already looking at people and how what made them tick and what made myself tick and where motivations came from and all that was really interesting. So the idea that people could actually grow and change and learn and be better. So it's kind of that optimistic viewpoint, I guess, comes from that. I was fortunate to find a life partner relatively early 
someone who shares a lot of the same beliefs and points of view. So we kind of reinforce it with each other. We've been together for 47 years at this point. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. And yeah, I think it's just part of the way that I am. And did this influence Zach McCracken in any way? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that was probably why I threw everything in there. The concept of karma, there's a bit where you, if you kill the squirrel early on, then there's a slight consequence later on. And that whole thing was, again, done tongue in cheek, but with an underlying seriousness that there's some truth there. Clearly, I wasn't just reading stuff about this and throwing it in there just to do it. I was putting in there because there is maybe the passion that I have for that whole area. I mean, I like the idea that people got exposed to those ideas in a way which was fun and playful and not heavy handed and dogmatic. It becomes part of people's past experience, having gone through this game and actually thinking in this universe where that's a part of all these new agey things. We already touched upon the characters of the game. How was the cast chosen? Hmm. I don't remember. I knew that the character Annie in the game is named after my wife. There's probably some inspiration I took from her in terms of her intelligence and her wisdom, really. The other two characters, the two co-eds, are both named after the girlfriends at the time of Ron Gilbert and Matthew Kane. <laughs> so we got their names in there. Only the names or also the personality? No, the names. I don't think there's any personality. The only gag was with Leslie's hair. If you took her helmet off in the game, her hair would be a different color each time. And that was kind of an in-joke because the Leslie, who was Matthew's girlfriend, would often dye her hair. And we come in each week and there'd be a different color. <laughs> so we kind of played with that. She ended up playtesting on the game too, which was kind of fun. So she got to playtest her character. I don't really think that most of the rest were really based on real people, just the people that we came up with. Let's talk a little bit about the gameplay. Do you have a formal like design goal envisioned what kind of game experience this would be? I think the only parameters I was imagining, you know, 30 or 40 hours of gameplay, that it would be funny. Zach would have his headlines that he'd spout off at different points of the game. He'd throw out a headline based on something weird that's happening. I don't think I sat down and said, this game has to be this, this, and this. It was just, here's the universe I want to put this in. And how am I going to pull all these elements together and make them fit in a cohesive story? Did you want to make a hard game or an easy game? I was thinking it would be equivalent to Maniac Mansion in terms of difficulty might be harder in that there's more stuff you probably have to get through. There are things which feel rooted in reality that you have to go to the airport, you have to buy tickets and you know things which I don't know that I do now in a game because they become tedious, but I think in some way that probably helped root it more in reality. The whole bit with a bus driver and having to pay, give him a cash card, that's the area in that game which was forever giving us issues because I was trying to make it real. There would always be these bugs that would show up because I was trying to make it feel like a real thing. If I just done, you walk up to the bus driver and you flip, you're at the airport or something, or whoever is near the bus would end up at the airport. But then you had a cash card, you have enough money on, the, on your cash card. If there's someone with you, do they are they supposed to get in the bus also if you want to get both of your characters there? What if you've given the cash card and there is enough money? What if one of you has enough money and the other one doesn't? Can one pay for each other? And all these things which made it way more complex. And by the end of the project, I'm sure all the code there was like the most convoluted display of spaghetti code that I had in the game. And that's why I kept on breaking. So I think I learned something about that. that if it's not going to really add to the gameplay, then simplify it and also Don't do things which are kind of tedious in real life. Why would you want to do it in a game as well? Since you mentioned the word tedious, why so many mazes? The mazes, some of them felt like you had to have a maze. I wanted to make it harder to get to someplace. So you got to the location, but then you had to go through something to find it. I wanted you to feel like you were in a large space and you had to work your way through to find it. I'd say there are people 
who love the maces. I'd say most people get tired of them. I personally did not like playing with them. I always had a map so I had to figure out how to get there or I'd use shortcuts to jump to the end of it so I didn't have to go through the tedious part. That was probably one thing I would change now. In games at the time, it was probably okay and it made the game feel more expansive, gave you a lot more hours of gameplay without increasing our graphics assets. The jungle mazes were always really more of a gag because they weren't mappable. You just have to keep going forward a couple doors, a couple entryways, and you make your way through. If you backtrack, then you get lost for a bit. So I don't know. I think it was something of the times that felt right. Maybe it was having played the original text adventure game with all of its mazes that kind of became a standard thing that you put into games. I've read a little anecdote somewhere that Sack McCracken was originally supposed to be a little bit easier, but in production, you were nudged towards making it harder so that Lucasfilm Games could sell more hint books. <laughs> no, I don't think that was ever the case. I mean, the same thing for any of the games we've done. I don't think we had any push either way on whether we should make them easier or harder. But no, you know, this is before the era of the internet, so you couldn't just pop online and look up a hint. So we had a hint line, which <laughs> charge people money per minute, I think, for going through the telephone tree looking for hints. We tried to replicate that in some degree in Thimbleweed Park, but obviously didn't charge for it. So, I mean, that may have turned out to be a profit center <laughs> for the company, but that wasn't the intent. I'd like to come back briefly to the question of humor, because you already explained that Sackmar Kraken was a humorous game and was always supposed to be such. And if I look at the entire line of LucasArts adventure games, many of them are humorous, are comedy adventure games. Do you have an explanation as to why that is? I'm guessing it's that, I mean, I know that when I was hiring people for our new batch of scum programmers, I guess 1989, I was specifically looking for people with senses of humor who could write and tell stories as much as they could program. To me, that was actually a more difficult skill to obtain than it would be to program. I figured we could teach them how to code the scum system, but we couldn't teach them how to be funny. So that was pretty important. That was part of the culture of the company. I think there was always a fun, loving element to the people we hired. The fact that, at least for a lot of the 80s, any lead who was hired, we would have these group interview sessions or they go and talk to pretty much all the other leads and people would give feedback and thumbs up and down whether they felt they would fit. So yeah, I mean, I guess... Loom and The Dig may not fit into that category at all. Mm. I never actually played The Dig, so I can't speak for that. It's not very funny. Yeah. And Loom was not intended to be funny. I mean, there are some smiles in there, but it wasn't a comedy game. Indiana Jones and Last Crusade, we did want to make it funny, but not as a comedy. So I think we kind of tried to match the tone of the films where you have a mix of adventure plus some levity in there, make it funnier, some jokes. He probably went more in that direction because with our in-jokes and other things that we would put in there. But of the games due to that's probably the least humorous of the ones I worked on. You know, how would you categorize Fate of Atlantis and their games? Probably similar. Yeah. Lighthearted, but not comedy adventures. Yeah. I think that kind of matches with the Indiana Jones films. Speaking of sense of humor, you were the one who created the infamous hamster in the microwave option in Maniac Mansion. And in Sack McCracken, players can shred the goldfish sushi and kill the two-headed squirrel. David, what do you have against animals? <laughs> yeah, given the option of saying, no, I won't do that, and giving the player kind of an in-joke thing, because neither of those are part of the gameplay. They aren't part of the puzzle solving. It just felt like it'd be a fun bit. I'm actually pretty nice to animals in real life. <laughs> Glad to hear. <laughs> and I sure hope that no one's gotten any ideas from those games and actually did it in real life after doing that in a game. Maybe I let them do it in a game so they don't have to do it in real life. <laughs> but yeah, the hamster bit was just, I mean, we had a hamster, you could pick it up and we had a microwave and it just seemed like, oh, uh, you get this flash of sick joke insight and I wire that up 
behind Ron's back. Didn't tell him I was going to do it. <laughs> I did ask Gary Winnick for the splat image on the microwave open door and then wired it up and called Ron in and said, here, sit down, try this. <laughs> he didn't know what was going to happen. So he laughed. It, it stayed in the game because it was funny. So, you know, looking for things that weren't part of the gameplay that you could try and you get a result that would match. I think part of what made the games really fun is that someone who had the same moment of inspiration, that sick moment that I did, and they try it and they actually find out that it works, is something they'll probably never forget because the game kind of anticipated what they might do. I think we did something with, if you had some radioactive water and you put it in the microwave, that re- result in the kid dying, you know, with radioactive steam pouring out and you inhale it and the kid would die. So, I mean, I feel like you had to have a consequence if they tried it. So you had to put that in there. Maybe there's a sick streak in me in a comedy sense, but not in a real life sense. <laughs> so we have fish. They're very safe. <laughs> <laughs> how successful was the game, both in how it was viewed internally and in raw numbers? I don't think I knew what the numbers were. I think it did well. I mean, all of our games are much better in Europe than they did in the United States, maybe proportionally. Zach, more than any other game, seems to have a huge following in Germany. I always kind of wondered about that, whether the humor just rang true or matched or what part of it made it so appealing there. All the fan-based games, created games, were from Germany or Austria. I don't know if other games that we did had that kind of following to create their own versions. So that was kind of fun. In the United States, I think that Sierra Online had such a huge lead. They were doing games for years before we did. So they had a huge following. And whenever they did a game, they would sell way more, 10 times as many copies in the United States than we could with any of our games. But the fact that they were using a text parser probably made them a lot more difficult to translate and to localize. And because we had the fixed verbs and you didn't have all the different combinations you might do otherwise. That made it easier maybe to localize them and do a really good job because you're really just localizing the text that's spoken as opposed to the whole user interface. And I don't think they had a presence in Europe. So the fact that we jumped there, I think we filled the niche that they filled in the United States. So that might've made it more popular. It never had a sequel inside the company that might've been partly because I wasn't there to do a sequel. I had already left by then and maybe it just didn't have the same level of popularity inside the company that it did outside. You know, it's one of those things that seems more like those films that kind of bomb when they first come out and then they become huge hits afterwards. Like Labyrinth actually kind of falls into that category where it just didn't have much of a following at the time, but afterwards people really liked it. Zach might fall into that. So I think it did okay. It wasn't a huge success in terms of like you know, massive sales, as far as I know. I'm sure Indiana Jones' Last Crusade did way better just because of the name recognition. But I think Maniac Mansion was also in that same category. It didn't have a huge following at the time, but then there was a sequel. So that kind of bumped up the original game a lot more. I think the first ones that really did a lot better were probably the Monkey Island ones. So. The fact that all these games are available now, you can download them from Steam or from GOG, meant that they have a life that will go on forever, which is kind of fun. We never thought anyone would know our games after the first two or three years after they came out. We figured the computers that we built them for would be gone and people would just stop playing them. And I just didn't think about the fact that computers were going to keep on getting more and more powerful, that you could do emulators or emulators of emulators of emulators, if you wanted to, and have them have a life that would go on forever. I actually had no idea that was happening until I went to a demo scene conference in Norway in, I think, 2004, and someone showed me Zach McCracken running on a Nokia phone at the time. I think it was a C64 emulator that had been ported over to Nokia and then they were able to play the game on it. So that kind of made me realize that, okay, that's why people seem to know our games because these are mostly young people there and they weren't even around when the games came out. So I guess they'll be there forever. They will. How much of an issue was software piracy for you back then? We had a really bad experience with the first two games, with Rescue of Fractalus and Ballblazer. 
we gave Atari demo versions of the game. I think they're in beta on floppy disks. We didn't do anything to serialize them. And we ended up finding out like within a week they had been distributed in all the BBSs around the country. Someone somewhere took the disk images and put them on the bulletin boards. And people were downloading them and playing them. There was no copy protection in the games at the time. And since we didn't serialize them, we couldn't really prove who actually did the release. And then all these things happened where the games came out much later than we had planned, which meant that by then a lot of people had already played them. So that was a pretty major thing. You know, it's possible that because of that, more people knew the name of the company, Lucasfilm Games, than would have otherwise because there was so much wide distribution. But for our later games, I know everything was pirated and cracked. I don't know how much of an issue that was for us. I think we expected it. We knew that. But then no matter what we put in there, that someone would find a way to crack it. In fact, cracking it was probably more fun for them than playing the games. (laughs) That became a game within a game. So maybe more because I had the early experience, how much of a betrayal that felt like the first ones. The other ones, I kind of was expecting it. And we still did stuff to try to prevent it and got more and more sophisticated ourselves. But, you know, it was kind of like a nuclear arms race. Everyone kept on increasing their ability to take out the copy protection and work around it. Zach McCracken has often been lauded as one of the best adventures ever made. And it has stayed with you for your whole life. You've been in touch with it ever since, as the game was available on ever new platforms. So in hindsight, how do you feel about this, this being such a big part of your life? Well, it's probably not that much in my consciousness now, partly because maybe at the time we really didn't have any direct feedback with any of the game players of the games or had no sense of how people were being affected by it really wasn't until social media and some trips we made recently to Europe where fans of the game could actually see me and seek me out that I actually started getting a sense of like how popular it was. Of the games I made, it's probably the one that I felt the most passion for, that's closest to my own personal likes and dislikes in terms of what goes in a game, and also probably the one that I had the most creative control over, other than, say, Rescue on Fractalus, that every other game I worked on there was really either someone else's game or it was a licensed product based on a movie. So it's unique in the at least the Lucas games I did where it was actually a story that I actually created myself and didn't really do any after that. Thimbleweed we Park, that's a story that was created by Ron and Gary that I kind of came in on after it was created. I had a lot that I got to contribute to it, but it, you know, I was still contributing to someone else's universe, which is very different. I just remember I had that interview with Noah, Noah Falstein, and he basically in passing, when he was talking about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, he mentioned what you were doing on the game and what Ron was doing on the game. And he said that you gravitated towards the art side and you were the liaison for the artist. So I wondered, is that something that you're interested in? Are you an artistic person? Hmm, I guess I don't think I would characterize that myself. I might have interacted with them more than he did because he wasn't doing any of the actual rooms. He was doing more of the dialogues. Ron and I split up all the rooms between each other and each took different sections of the game. My primary thing I was doing in the game was coding. Just like with the other games, you describe the room to the artist. The artist would give you back what you want. And you might have a couple of go-arounds or back and forths. The fact that we had production stills from the movie meant that we could do something based on the original photographs that were taken during production, or we could go back to the library at the ranch, talk to the librarian, say, what were the reference books that you gave to the people who did the movie for this scene, for the castle, for example, and we would get some of the same reference material. So more than our other games because it was reusing a lot of existing environments. It didn't have to be quite as original, and we obviously had to redo it to match the needs for the game. So I think, to answer your original question, I definitely don't consider myself an artist. I I have painted a little bit as a hobby before. You took art class, but it's probably not something which I see myself as being a part of. I feel like I'm more of a world builder, in a sense. Someday I would love to learn how to do really advanced 3D graphic modeling, but who knows if I'll ever get the chance to do that. 
So my final question would be, what does your wife, Annie, think of Zach McCracken? Ah, well, I think she feels honored that she's in it. She was blown away when we went to Italy two years ago for that anniversary, where people were coming up to her and asking for her autograph. Or we could be in a car with someone getting a ride with one of the fans and said, I can't believe it that Annie Laris is in my car. Because Annie Laris was her maiden name. So she was getting this level of celebrity because a game character was based on her, kind of. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But you know, she likes the game, she likes the concept. She were definitely in tune with a lot of the things that went into it. She definitely had some issues with the FM Towns box cover art. The original one that we saw had Annie depicted as wearing like either a mini skirt or really short shorts, very sexual, and she just objected. So they switched the art and gave her jeans, but it's still kind of very suggestive, kind of bizarre pose. It doesn't match the character at all, the way that she should be depicted, but we couldn't get them to shift it. I guess they were doing it for the Japanese audience, and that was just what they were going to go with. She did end up on a playing card for that game, which is kind of fun. Thank you so much, David, for taking all of this time and answering all of our questions. It was very fun. And you guys ask some questions I have never been asked before, which is always the sign of a really good interview. Yeah, I like that. So thank you guys. <laughs> thank you very much. 